Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role-playing games and lots of them. I upload twice a week with a live stream every weekend. I make a lot of content that is requested by viewers, including today's video on the devil named Moloch, a classic figure that most D&D fans will recognize from this often memed image which adorned the AD&D Player's Handbook 1st Edition original cover. Fun fact, I didn't actually have that book. Our group had the second version of the cover for 1st Edition AD&D Player's Handbook. Moloch is a great square-bodied creature with red-orange skin. He has short, thick arms and legs and huge square hands and feet. His feet and head are horned. His head is huge with slanting eyes and a gaping mouth that looks more like the mouth of a shark than a man. His eyes glow yellow and his very dark red horns are jagged and viciously sharp. He rarely adorns himself in the opulent wealth he holds, wearing only a simple loincloth of some sort of flame-proof leather. He's as strong as a hill giant, and he attacks by grabbing and crushing or piercing a victim with his huge hands and taloned fingers, followed by a bite attack of his shark-toothed maw. Moloch carries and at times may choose to employ a six-tailed whip made of an unknown pliable metal that carries a constantly crackling and spitting charge of lightning, and is so greatly feared by less powerful devils who have no resistance to that form of attack. Moloch, in the same manner as Belzebul, delights in the act of torture and doesn't spare other devils from his activities at all. Visitors to Malbolg to this day may note that a great number of the devils there have missing fingers, limbs, eyes and great scars from eons of abuse. The seething hatred that both Moloch and Belzebul instilled in lesser devils resulted in Malbolg always being on the very cusp of open rebellion and more than any other layers of hell, Malbolg has gone through the most upheavals and changes. Its current state, as horrifically noxious as it is, has almost reverted back to its former state. For more information on Melbolg and its current ruler, Glazier, you can check out the Adventurers League sourcebook titled Pip Yap's Guide to the Nine Hells, which is designed as an expansion supplement for the Descent into Avernus campaign book. Or you can just go watch my video on Glazier on this channel. I'll pop a link to the video here for you. Moloch is a former Grand Duke of Hell who has existed for an incredible span of eons. He was not the leader of the celestial host which liberated nine planes of the abyss, but he was responsible for driving the last of the demons from what became the nine layers of hell. He was promoted from Archdevil to the rulership of the layer of Malbolg, the sixth layer of hell, which at the time was a smouldering volcanic ruin, the air hot and choking, the ground setting anything flammable afire if it sat still for too long. In its many caves, massive caverns and lava tubes, the sites of thousands and thousands of tremendous battles with demonic swarms where chaotic magic and the mutagenic touch of the far realm twisted the forms of the celestials as they finally managed to tear the plane free of Obox Ob's grasp, proving finally that it was actually possible to fight the abyss itself, though the cost was unimaginable. At the end of this early stage of the Blood War, the leaders of the Hells were simply the remaining commanders of whatever forces were left, marshalling and preparing for counterattacks, restocking their troop numbers in any way they could, such as finding ways to convert whatever native life remained on the liberated layers into what became the named forms of the complex hierarchy of what now is called the Devils. For eons, Moloch ruled his domain, vying against the other Arc Devils as he sought still greater power. He remembers well the countless political upheavals and the departure, demotion or death of so many of the original fallen celestials, including Lucifer, and the slow realisation among all the archdevils that Asmodeus was the foremost threat to all of them, with his masterful tactics of pitching their rivalry against each other, thereby controlling them all. Asmodeus took full advantage of Moloch's evil scheming to keep other archdevils in check, and at some point even knocked Moloch back to a subservient position of Viceroy by appointing Belzebul, Lord of Flies, the ruler of the Lair of Meldog, redirecting Moloch's rebellious efforts to usurping the Usurper. Dragon Magazine issue 76, published in 1983, has the second part of the first reasonably detailed overview of the Nine Hells that we were given. It's described the Lair of Meldog as it was back when it was ruled by Belzebul. Belzebul at the time was ruler of two different planes and thus found it very difficult to keep control, so he basically left the running of Malbolg to Moloch, using his herald Neobaz to relay all of his orders to the fuming Moloch, who was constantly having to relocate to one or the other of the countless copper-roofed fortresses on the layer, 
where the rain of boulders hurling from the sky pounded against the metal, and down below the adamantine pillars holding the fortresses secure above the frequent avalanches of rock or pyroclastic mayhem, thousands of cages held the tortured and mutilated prisoners subjected to punishing bludgeoning from the rocks flying past all the time. Even now, most of the notable locations on the layer are located hugging the surface of cliffs or deep inside sheltered caverns. The rain of rock makes life in the open in Melbog damn near impossible. The rule of Belzebul came to an end, though, when Moloch took the night hag named Malagard for his advisor, replacing his former herald Tartak, legate of Belzebul, to the court of Moloch, officially. But a real turncoat coat and backstabber, even by the wretched standards of the Nine Hells, was Tartak, and we still see him around today. Malagard was extremely bad news, of course. While Moloch bathed in a putrescent pus pool contained in one of the domains, Relaxing to the ambient sounds of tormented screams, one of the numerous night hag consorts rubbed thick grease extracted from the fiery tombs of blasphemers and heretics into his skin and whispered in his ear. Moloch was seduced by the ambitious night hag Malagard, and she convinced Moloch that he actually had a good chance of usurping Asmodeus, and through the resulting conspiracy, they nearly succeeded, but it was thwarted. Moloch was stripped of his station and sentenced to death, and only the timely use of a planar portal allowed him to escape the Nine Hells entirely. Glazier was then installed after a brief reign by Malagard, and that brings us to the modern age of Melbolg. I would love to make videos about the giant hell lice teeming in the thick forest of hair, still sprouting from flaking white soil in the shadow of great cliffs and lit by the crimson light of lava falls, as well as the lightning spitting from pyroclastic clouds, or the horrific heaps of glistening flesh on top of three stumpy legs with dozens of waving tentacles, which are the Caliban devils, these newly formed nightmares covered in pus oozing sphincters are devils that have budded and spawned from the decaying remains of Malagard, which are slowly evolving into female humanoid forms with rotten purple flesh and hair made of white twitching tendrils that resemble more and more the original night hag. Perhaps I'll get around to them one day. Unbeknownst to Moloch, Malagard was playing three sides in her bid for power. While she whispered in Moloch's ear, she was working for his arch nemesis Gerion, having felt the wild beast had greater station and that helping him could boost her own status. Meanwhile, she was also conspiring with Glazia, Princess of Hell, which was all part of Glazia's grand scheme to reshape the political landscape of the Nine Hells in the series of events now called The Reckoning. It was Glazia who fed Moloch false information that Mephistopheles was about to move against him, kicking off the whole disaster that spelt the doom of Moloch and installing a new ruler in Melbolg. Whoever's in charge within this layer, intruders are always brought alive by the Horned Devils to their commander for torment and questioning, as failure from the Horned Devils to capture and deliver interlopers generally results in them being subjected to the same sort of torture, so they are highly motivated. Few intruders escape, and fewer still are allowed to live for any length of time unless the ruler of Malbog says so. Much as the other devils would love to vent their seething hatred and resentment on any other creature that they can get their hands on. These days, Moloch is an archdevil in exile, a strange state of affairs indeed. Morden Cain in the Ark Wizard says that Moloch obsesses over power he lost rather than power he could gain elsewhere in the plains, which is a pity he wastes his potential. His entry in Morden Cain's Tome of Foes talks about what he did after he was exiled from the Nine Hells, and I quote, Moloch wasted no time in preparing for his return. He amassed an army of devils and monsters and left them to make final preparations for invading the Nine Hells, where he ventured to a distant material plane in the hope of finding an artifact that would ensure his success. While there, he became trapped, leaving his armies at the mercy of his enemies. In short order, they were destroyed. Now, Moloch has been rendered nearly powerless after his last failure. He endlessly schemes of ways to return to his former status, but every time he enters the Nine Hells, he's demoted to an imp and can't regain his normal powers until he leaves. Thus, he lives a split existence, sometimes scheming in Malbolg or other layers of the Hells, and at other times wandering the plains searching for magical might or secrets that might help him win back his title. Rumours suggest that he can be found in Sigil, where he bargains with Ugolos to build yet another army with which he might invade Melbog and wrest the throne from Glazia. Bereft as he is, he has little to offer in exchange, so he might bargain with mortals to gain their aid in acquiring coin, jewels and other riches in return for knowledge about the Nine Hells and the other planes. 
It is possible to find tieflings of Moloch's heritage. They are, as you can imagine, some very tough, large brutes, built more like half-orcs than humans. Most do not have tails and grow horns like a crown on their head. They may have a jaw full of shark-like teeth, orange, red skin, yellow eyes, and an intimidating nature. They gain plus two to strength and plus one to charisma and know the thaumaturgy cantrip. When they reach third level, they can cast the disguise self spell once per long rest. At fifth level, they gain the ability to cast invisibility once per long rest. Charisma is their spell casting ability for these spells and they require no study or material components to cast them. As for the stats of Moloch, he is represented in full in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. As you can imagine, he's fairly gnarly in combat and rarely engages foes without first hurling a lot of other formidable troops in to soften up his enemy. He prefers to finish off injured foes with great cruelty and pain. He's a large fiend, standing over 14 and a half feet tall and weighing thousands of pounds, with a natural armor class of 19. Average of 253 hit points, though, he, they could be as high as 352 if you decide to max out the dice rolls, which I suggest you do. He has a speed of 30 feet per round, dark vision to 120 feet, passive perception of 21, and is a challenge rating 21 legendary foe with legendary resistance three times per day and legendary actions, which include casting Stinking Cloud, teleportation, and making additional whip attacks on other creatures' turns. He's very tough, totally immune to fire and poisons, resistant to taking half damage from cold, non-magical and non-silvered physical bludgeoning, slashing and piercing damage, immune to exhaustion and being charmed or frightened, regenerating 20 hit points at the start of his turn in the round which only radiant damage can prevent and he only dies if he starts the round with zero hit points and with his regeneration not functioning. He's also resistant to magic, gaining advantage on every saving throw against spells and other magical effects, unless he decides to use his legendary resistance and just choose to make the saving throw, uh, choose to pass the saving throw, I should say. All weapons he picks up and all his hand-to-hand -hand attacks count as magical, plus he has innate spellcasting powers based on his charisma of 23. Moloch makes three attacks on his turn, either a spell and two other attacks, or perhaps a bite, claw, and whip attack. He still uses that magical metal whip, it has a 30 foot reach, is plus 15 to hit one target, inflicts 2d4 plus 8 slashing damage plus 2d10 lightning damage, and if the target is a creature, it must succeed on a DC 24 strength saving throw or be pulled up to 30 feet in a straight line toward Moloch. His bite and claw attacks are both plus 15 to hit, and the claw has a reach of 10 feet and does 2d8 plus 8 slashing damage. His bite does 4d8 plus 8 piercing damage. He can choose to teleport instead of his usual movement, taking himself and anything he is wearing or carrying up to 120 feet to a spot he can see before he gets there. This could include midair. Also, he has a special attack called Breath of Despair that recharges after use each round if a 5 or 6 is rolled on a 6-sided die. Moloch exhales in a 30-foot cube. Each creature in that area must succeed on a DC 21 wisdom saving throw or take 5d10 psychic damage, drop whatever they're holding and become frightened for one minute. While frightened in this way, a creature must take the dash action and move away from Moloch by the safest available route on each of its turns, unless there's nowhere to move, in which case it just cowers in place. If the creature ends its turn in a location where it doesn't have line of sight to Moloch, only then can the creature repeat the saving throw, ending the effect on a success. So if Moloch keeps in sight and keeps chasing them, that's it, they just run forever. Moloch's innate spells include Alter Self, Animate Dead, Burning Hands equal to a 7th level spell, Confusion, Detect Magic, Fly, Gersh, Major Image, Stinking Cloud, Suggestion, and Wall of Fire, all of which he can cast at will. Plus, once per day, uh, per long rest, I should say, he can cast Flame Strike and the stunning version of the Symbol spell. He prefers to pull opponents in and rip them to shreds with his bare hands, but uses his Stinking Cloud and Breath of Despair to break up groups of foes when he's outnumbered. Dragon Magazine issue 91 tells us that his metal whip is composed of an alloy known as Jajava, a flexible light grey green substance forged from the combination of iron and a metal exclusive to hell called Arjail. The lightning charge of the whip is not actually a property of the metal whip, the electricity has been conducted through the whip from Moloch instead. Also, Moloch owns more than one metal whip, including another that has four pliable strands of metal 
which burst into pale blue flames when swung. Stripped of his title, robbed of power and bereft of most possessions, Molox knows that if he is killed and forced to reform back in the Nine Hells, he will incarnate as nothing more than a lowly imp, and only be able to return to his former appearance and power if he manages to leave Hell again. <laughs> it's said that he's trying once again to rebuild his army, uh, as I mentioned in Sigil, but since he is destitute, he is able to offer knowledge of the multiverse to mortals he's encountered in exchange for material wealth something he needs ludicrous quantities of in order to deal with hiring a Yugoloth army. So that's a possible adventure lead if you want to deal with getting information from Moloch. Though Moloch once had some base of worshippers, apparently having inspired fanatical loyalty in at least some of them, it crumbled away after his defeat. The few fractured cults that remain are small and its members are incapable of casting spells over third level. Still, a few glorifying statues of the Duke still stand, with faint remnants of power still lingering within and around them. Oh, and in case you wondered about Moloch being able to escape death by using a planar portal, he didn't do this within the Nine Hells. He was actually plummeting to the ground in a ball of fire on the Prime Material Plane when he used the portal to escape, so for a while everyone thought he actually was destroyed. His original plan to re-enter Hell required the use of an artifact called the Stone of Corbinet, also known as the Apocalypse Stone. The Stone of Corbinet anchors the Prime Plane to the rest of the multiverse. If the stone is removed from its proper resting place, the world shifts out of alignment, losing contact with the rest of the planes. Without access to the outer planes, the souls of the dead are trapped, and without access to the inner planes, the world suffers ever more severe natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, and so on. I have no idea how Moloch planned to use that artifact to get into the Nine Hells, but if he managed to steal it, he would have destroyed a decent chunk of the Prime Material Plane. He hates the Prime Material Plane and wouldn't have cared at all. We have some more information on Moloch, courtesy of Dragon Magazine issue 360. Eventually, Moloch managed to work his way back to Bator through several vile acts and bargains, although he couldn't seem to leave afterwards and became one of the notable outcast dukes of Avernus, referred to as the Rabble of Devilkin. From there, he led a group of subversive exiles and plotted a b to build a new army, take vengeance and conquer hell. However, it seemed his schemes didn't bear fruit since after his latest failure, he was rendered politically, monetarily and physically powerless. Still, Moloch continued his mission to reclaim his status, whether it meant getting himself back into the good graces of Asmodeus, pretty difficult considering the orbit spat in Asmodeus' face, or dealing with other fiendish races to take Melbol back by force. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, Check out my Subscribestar or Patreon links for all the full scripts for these videos, buy some Teespring merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.